shit right here later. Right there. That's the shitting spot. I know. Everyone knows. It's my spot. Why no one sits here? Now it's, now it's kind of too high. Where are you? <laughs> the ghost of Christmas past is currently watching me from beyond the curtain. Hello friends and welcome to another video and welcome to the channel where for the entire month of June we will be focusing on queer authors for Pride Month. Very exciting, very fun. Welcome to this precarious setup. You're currently balanced on a chair, two trash cans, two water bottles, and I'm on the verge of falling off of the balcony, but it's all worth it because we get to talk about The House on the Cerulean Sea. This book is by TJ Klune, who is an asexual author. I have read one other book by this author. It was Under the Whispering Door. I read it a week or two ago. I think it's the best book I've read this year. It was my favorite book that I've read this entire year. So, you know, that's saying something. They're very cozy. They're not serious at all. They're just very cozy books about I think I've heard that this one is really big on found family, so I'm definitely expecting a lot of that. I don't know if there's queer characters in this, but I know in Under the Whispering Door, the two main characters were both men who were attracted to each other. So I'm thinking there might be some more of that in this because the back does say that Linus and Arthur grow closer. I don't know anything about these guys, but maybe it's a romantic thing. But after I finished reading that book, I had looked up the author and I saw that he was asexual and that does play a part in writing romances. And I was very excited to pick up this book because I feel like this is definitely the more popular of all of his releases. The back says, being queer himself, Clune believes it's important now more than ever to have accurate, positive queer representation in stories. So I thought that was just perfect for this video. But either way, this book is extremely popular. It's been circulating TikTok for however many years it's been out, honestly. And the reason I picked it for today specifically is because we are on vacation at the beach. I am currently in a hotel room looking out at the water. So this is definitely gonna be a more vloggy reading vlog. Some of these are gonna be a lot more sit down talking through the whole thing. But this one, I really just want to experience this because these stories are just so fun to sit with. You're following Linus, a caseworker in the department in charge of magical youth. He's 40, so again, you're dealing with older men in queer relationships, which I think is such a beautiful thing. I absolutely love that the author goes into stuff like that. Travel to an orphanage on a distant island and determine whether six dangerous magical children are so dangerous that they're likely to bring about the end of days. The House in the Cerulean Sea is an enchanting love story masterfully told about the profound experience of discovering an unlikely family in an unexpected place and realizing that family is yours. So yeah, definitely big on the whole found family thing. I will say, this video is going to be full spoilers. The last one, I tried to avoid it. Again, with all of the videos this month, we're kind of going to be changing up the style, changing the way that I do things, just depending on the book and how I'm feeling that day, honestly. But for this one, I definitely want to talk freely about anything that happens, just because in the last one, it did bring me to tears by the end of it and i think if something similar happens in this book and i'm not able to talk about it in a video i will combust so we are for sure going to be talking about anything in this book i currently have three observers standing just beyond a glass door and they're all looking at me record it's 7 10 on may 25th i really shouldn't be up this early because we didn't go to bed until 1 a.m we were watching sharknado the view was just too good you know a sunrise on the beach I'm being looked at. So I think we're gonna go. We're gonna maybe get some Starbucks. They opened at seven. That sounds pretty good. Maybe walk on the beach. Maybe go to the aquarium this trip. Honestly, like I said, it's gonna be a very vloggy reading vlog. We're just gonna have the full beach experience while reading this book. I'm so excited. I've never matched the vibes better to the environment. Okay, they're coming outside. I'm gonna go. I guess so. <laughs>
829 is significantly more than 35. <laughs> He's your, a boy. your computer is opening and closing every application. <laughs> He's a skater boy. He's a skater boy. <laughs> Woke up, no. Went to bed at 2 a.m. because we were watching Sharknado. Woke up at 7 a.m., 6 a.m., went on the balcony, had a full meal breakfast that they served to us, went in the ocean, feared the Sharknado. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Important step. <laughs> Got home. I don't think I was involved at that point. Oh. <laughs> you must have missed it. And it's not even 12. <sighs> oh, the joys of being a tourist in your own state. We were in Starbucks. In the closed Starbucks. We've been waiting for, for so many months. Probably longer, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> one appropriate course of action right now. Huh? See the dolphin? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's go see those $35 dolphins. Each dolphin is $35. They pay us, actually. The dolphins hand deliver us. Um, fin deliver us. The beak. <laughs> what do they have? <laughs> Dolphin Beak delivers us $35 for our time. It's vital to the Florida tourist experience. We have to see the dolphins. <laughs> I'm gonna need you to give me a little jig. <laughs> there he goes. Lovely day, impending doom. Kill, 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 kill.
Sometimes all you need is a little 12 a.m. surf style. I'm just gonna pretend to be a book merchant and then you interact with me. In the We're back. We uh, got books. I like Charles Dickens. That's the only reason I got that book. Yes. This one. I got these two because I've heard that they're sad and they're little, so I think it'll be okay. I got this one because it's not by just some other white guy, and it looked kind of nice. I like how the cover has- I normally judge a book by its cover. As you can see here, <laughs> I got this book last time we went to the library, and I wanted to get it again because I never read it, and it got- it was there for too long. Um, one of the customers at our Starbucks told me I should read this. I saw people talking about it because it had a pool on the cover. This is about, um, pre- Donald Trump inauguration. Pre, where we go to Barnes, I've liked it and wanted to get it. Um, and then I saw this and I was like, well, it's a graphic novel. I like those. Oh, also, yeah, but you can get Wii games at the library. We're going to play Kirby. We got home. It smells like new house. We're going to play Legends of Zelda. I'm so fucking tired. <laughs> magical child's house to, to make sure that everything's okay. We opened up the file and the first one is a guy named Lucy. And then it says name, Lucifer. <laughs> Nickname Lucy. Age, six years, six months, and six days. Species of magical youth, Antichrist. <laughs> All right, hello. Welcome back to the unflattering angle of my bedroom updates. We got back from our trip maybe yesterday morning. I didn't end up reading that much. I think I got 30 pages through just because I was having a good time on the beach. Currently, I'm 75 pages through. Linus has just gotten to this house, which can we just shout out the covers that this author has? Both of these covers are so stunning and they are both described in the books exactly how they look on the covers. I think that is done so well and I think it captures the essence of both of these stories really, really well. They both just look and feel so right. I was a little bit scared to go into this book just because I liked Under the Whispering Door so much and I didn't know if this one could compete, but this is the one that I've heard a lot more about. Both of these are really cozy, really just comforting reads. I think if you like one, you'll definitely like the other because they are very similar. There are a lot of similarities. Both main characters are older. They take work too seriously. They don't really enjoy their lives because they're so busy working. In both books, there is a secret folder for the client. In Whispering Door, the people that show up at this tea shop are dead and the owner of the tea 
shop gets a secret file that only he can read and it has information about their lives. In this book, Linus gets a folder full of information about the house that he's going to visit. And also in both of these, there's a quote that's nearly identical. I probably wouldn't have noticed it if I hadn't read them so close together, but I remember this exact conversation happening. I will show you guys if I can find it, but essentially in both of these books, the main grumpy guy, he's taking work so seriously, and then he meets up with somebody who's taking him on his way, and they both have conversations where a person asks, do you talk without saying anything? Calling out the other person, saying that everything that you say is just useless being thrown out there, it doesn't mean anything. And I just thought it was funny that that conversation pretty much exactly came up in both of these books. So there are definitely a lot of similarities, but because they are just lighthearted, fun reads, it doesn't really impact the reading experience. You're able to enjoy it, even if it is essentially just the same story rewritten. I'm not saying that it is, but because of the type of story that it is, that doesn't take away from the experience. If you enjoy one of them and you want to find more like it, you already have another option right there. But I totally understand why people love this story. It is so lighthearted and fun to read. There are times where I will skim over entire pages, but you don't really lose anything. You don't need to sit down and focus super hard to get through these books. Something I wrote down, I said it feels like these books are like video games in their descriptions and with their interactions, but it could just be because Kaylin was playing I Am Dead. Very, very similar to Under the Whispering Door, where the main character is dead and they're just kind of looking back at their life. It's just really fun. I'm probably gonna keep saying it, but it's so true. These books are just such a good time. So it's currently Sunday, May 28th. It is 10.30 p.m. I'm on page 75 of this book. I think my goal for tonight is to hit 100 pages and then tomorrow I'm probably gonna go to the cafe and just try and power through as much of this book as I can because I'm really trying to pump out as many videos as possible before June hits because once we get into it, we're in it. So I'll see you tomorrow. Hello, it is currently almost 6 p.m. the next day. We did end up going to the cafe and I got all the way up to page 208, so we made some good progress. I still stand by everything that I said last night about how similar these two stories are, but I think the main difference is this one kind of tackles the bigger subject of discrimination, because the whole thing in this is that the kids are monsters. They're not really accepted by anybody else. They're hidden away in this house. They're not able to live up to their full potential because in their heads, they're never gonna be good enough for people to like. I really like the way that the main character's narration happens because he'll say one thing and then you get to see his thought where it's the complete opposite thing. It makes everything feel so genuine because you really get to know the character through the things that he's saying and the way that he's acting. And I will say one thing to make other people happy even if it's not at all the thing that he cares about. I really like the way that the magic is established, the way that all these different creatures are introduced because it's very casual. It's not info dumpy, it's not throwing a bunch of things at you, it's just here's another thing that exists in this world. So for example, he gets to the island and he sees that there are sprites that live there and you just learn that there are nature sprites around and that they're protective and that they hide their things and you just learn these things piece by piece because the main character knows all of it already. So when it comes up, it's very natural. And I really like that because the main character is so informed on the situation, you don't have that thing where he goes to a place and then the characters there have to teach him about everything. You don't have to be taught, you just kind of experience it. I like the way that it casually moves around expectations. So for example, Talia, the gnome, is the only lady gnome. That's what makes her different. And then you also have Lucy, which is typically a lady's name, but it's a six-year-old boy. Just little things like that, where the story is just a little bit outside of what you expect. And just the whole idea of it, the whole thing of having these scary monsters that are hidden away because they're so dangerous, and then they're getting told off by this 45 year old man and being sent away to do their chores. I think it's so silly and I love the way that they try and threaten and they try to be all mean and tough, but it's all just for show because really they're just kids. At this point, you get a pretty good idea of who all the six kids are. So there's Talia, a 263 year old gnome lady with a beard, which might not sound like a child, but gnomes are kids until they're 500 years old. Theodore, who's a wyvern, which is like a dragon. Fee, a forest sprite, who's maybe 10 ish. Sal, who's 14, he weighs 150 pounds, except for when he gets frightened and he turns into a five pound white Pomeranian. Chansey? There's a U in there. But he's 10 years old, nobody knows what species he is, and he just wants to be a bellhop. And every time I think of him, I picture Bob from Monsters vs. Aliens. And then of course there's Lucy, Lucifer, son of the devil. He's six year old and he really likes to play into this whole idea of what he is, but then you kind of get to see him more personally and you realize he's just another kid. There's a point where the kids are talking and Linus, the main character, says that he's gonna just have a salad because he's trying to lose some weight. They address that he's a little 
little bit round and the kids say what's wrong with that because Tally is a gnome she's a round little lady and they're like what's so bad about that maybe I want to be round in the moment it's really light-hearted but also it does comment on how easily kids are influenced by the things that adults say. So if he sees himself badly because he is round and then he's saying this in front of the kids who might feel the same way, they might feel like they look the same way, they're gonna take that in. So you just, you have to be positive around kids and you have to think highly of yourself because if you talk down on yourself, then kids are gonna internalize that. And I think where I'm at right now at page 175 is kind of the turning point where he starts to treat them like a family instead of clients, where he starts to take on this guardian role and of being just an observer they're having an adventure game they're going out into the forest and he plays along into their little game and it's the first time that he genuinely just goes along with it he's kind of more carefree he plays into whatever they want from him and shortly after that you get a scene where sal the one that's super afraid comes up and offers to give a tour of his room which is something that he's been holding off on and it's just so cute I'm on page 246, Lucy just had a nightmare, woke up the whole house, he was shaking everything. He broke all his favorite records and then he woke up. Lydas picked up the pieces, put them back together and said, when something is broken, you can put it back together. It may not fit quite the same or work like it did once before, but that doesn't mean it's no longer useful. And then they offered to go to the record store. Lucy asked Lydas if he would record shop with him since they have the same taste in music. It's just so sweet how all the kids came together and they tried to say don't worry he's not dangerous he's not gonna hurt us please don't take us all away from each other this whole book is very much giving miss peregrine's home for peculiar children this gathering of magical children who are very much isolated from the rest of the world but the family dynamic between all these kids who have to stick together it just it's so good every time i know you'll probably need to put this in your report i can't blame you for that nor will i try to stop you but i do ask that you remember that lucy has never hurt anyone there's so much good in him but i don't think he would survive away from us I meant what I said, he's good, there's so much good in him. They just think so highly of each other, even when the whole world is against that. Hello and good morning. We've reached what I would consider the third act conflict, even though I don't know if that exists outside of romance. It has to, that has to just be a thing, right? Either way, it is vaguely related to the romance. <laughs> Something that comes up throughout this book is you get to see the letters that Linus is sending to his company and then the company is sending back, where they send him in the first place because he was super objective and he really stuck to the rules. And then obviously as he goes there, he gets super attached to these people and his reports become more emotional. So you get to see the first report where he's trying to get on everything and then the second report where he's like, well, it's kind of okay that they're doing this. And then by the third report, he's fully excusing it because he's seen that they're all doing okay, even if it's not by following the actual rules. Because the rules are just guidelines, and then Arthur brings up the fact that they're all rules made by humans for children that are very much other. <laughs> So you want to keep reading to see how these letters are going to progress and how the company is going to respond to his new behavior. And then this third letter in the third week that he's there, it sends files about Arthur because the first file that he got, you didn't really get any information. You just know who he is, like his name, and that's pretty much it. And now the company is sending this thick file of some secrets that he doesn't know yet about Arthur. They're like, hey, don't get too close. We all, we all have our secrets. So this whole final thing is just seeing that not everything is as it seems, I guess. And it's interesting because as the reader or as Linus, whichever one, you don't really care about the flaws of these characters because you see all the good in them. That's kind of all that's being presented in this book is just that they're kids and they're hanging out and they're having fun and whatever they're doing is working. So now the fact that there's more information, it's not even something that you consider because you're just seeing them have a good time. So as the reader, you're feeling the same thing as Linus where it's like, I don't know if I want to know this information. I wish we could just stay in this happy place and not even think about what else there is. So I'm on page 288 out of three something. I have like 100 pages left. I will write down anything I want to talk about and we'll address it tonight. I will see you then.
Hello my friends, it is 11 p.m. on May 31st and I'm happy to announce that I did finish House in the Cerulean Sea. We really put it off until the last hour. I think I would give this book maybe a 4.25 but like a solid 4.25. I get a feeling when I'm reading like halfway through and I just know where it's gonna be and then if the ending is completely outstanding or really terrible then that'll change it but for the most part I get a good idea of what I want to rate things before I ever get near the end and for this one I was feeling a mid four the whole way through. I have lots of things that I wrote down while I was reading through this since I wasn't really talking to the camera so I'm just gonna go through this list because if I try to figure out what I was saying we're gonna be here all night. First I was trying to figure out why I prefer Under the Whispering Door and I said I prefer the imagery of an isolated tea shop over a big island family which isn't really true. I think they're both really interesting settings. So then I said I think maybe I just want to be different and not say that I like this one more because this is kind of the more popular one so I wanted to say I liked a different book. And to be fair, I'm sure that's part of it, but that doesn't change the fact that I just didn't get the same feeling from this book. So then I said maybe it's just because I like the dog in the other book. Maybe this one is just for cat people because there's a cat in this, there's a dog in that. I was really going through everything, which it's not at all to say that I disliked this book. I was just trying to figure out, since there are so many similarities, what was it that made them different? What was it that really made one stand out to me? And the final thing that I settled on was maybe because this has so many more people, which that also doesn't really hold up because some of my favorite books have a pretty big friend group. So I was really trying to figure it out, and I think I figured it out, but we'll get to that in a little bit. I really wanted a nice distraction, which I'm so used to reading sad and serious books about life where people are struggling. I don't normally gravitate towards just good feeling books, so it's really nice to find something where it's super low stakes and there's no real emotional damage. It's just a good time. And I 100% want to pick up more books like that in the future because it is just so comforting to read books like that and to not have to worry about your own troubles you can fully escape into these worlds and these interactions and it's just I'm gonna keep saying it it's comforting it's cozy it's fun we get it I know I don't need to keep repeating it but it's so true and I haven't really experienced that with reading in so long I've kind of forced myself into reading this very specific thing and now that I'm branching out I'm just enjoying it so much I really like the subtle ways that Linus's development is shown at the start of the book they make note of the fact that his cat meows at him or his cat will just kind of make noises and he doesn't doesn't know what's going on. It's just some random cat that he found that joined him in his life. And then the first time he meets these kids, he can't really understand what they're saying because some of them do not speak English or speak at all really. They just kind of make grumbly noises and he doesn't know what they're saying. And then by the end of the book, he can understand all of the children as well as his own cat. And it's not that they are all of a sudden speaking a language that he can understand. It's just he's been around them so much that he knows what they're saying. And it's just stuff like that where it's just so cute. He formed connections with all of these people and now he can just understand and it's just so sweet. And then while I was reading these last like 80-ish pages, I didn't have my phone or anything with me so I just started writing notes in the front page of this book. It's very messy and I was considering erasing it as I talked about them but I think I might just leave it because I kind of like, I don't know, I like the little personal touch. But it'll just be a nice memory of our time together for this video. <laughs> So I wrote on page 302, they talk about love and power and also armies versus families. Arthur had finally talked about what he is to Linus. They've brought it all into the open and they're talking about how now Linus just has this gathering of children that people don't really want to accept. Linus says, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. And Arthur is proud of that fact, the way that he's able to take these kids and make a safe place for them, something that he didn't have in his childhood. And people are afraid that he He's gonna make this army of super powerful, super dangerous, scary kids, but really they're just building a family. They just want to be safe and understood. And also the island sprite that's going around, she accepted the risk to announce her presence because of how important the children are to her. She needed you to see that she wasn't going to let them go without a fight. So by this point, it's really well established that everybody on the island cares so much about each other. They would do anything to protect each other and to stay together. And Linus is really learning that these people want to be together and that they are a good fit for each other. I read this to Kaylin and it almost brought us both to tears. Arthur is so in love with Linus, which I will say I don't think it's very well established. I didn't really feel the connection except for when Arthur is saying how much he adores this man. It is so... It says, you're too precious to put into words. I think it's like one of Theodore's buttons. If you asked him why he cared about them so, he would tell you it's because they exist at all. 
every single time they are appreciating each other. It is just the sweetest thing. I know I said before that the third act conflict was him finding out that Arthur is a phoenix, which again, I don't know if a third act conflict even applies here, but also a bigger conflict that comes up is that the townspeople are gonna riot and they're gonna try and come and storm the island. It doesn't end up happening. It's like a dozen people that are just angry but at that point Arthur reveals to the entire people there that he is a phoenix and that's kind of the big final moment but it's really not a big deal it said there's a dozen people that's really not very significant and they can't even get across because the ferryman won't let them so it's like that's what I'm saying it's very very low stakes but also because of that the ending just isn't very dramatic because there wasn't much risk in that whole situation I mean obviously the biggest risk of all would be if they have to split up and if the house is going to be taken away but it's a happy ending that gets resolved they get to stay together i really like the arguments with all the townspeople they're just so silly talking to each other they're like really poorly written movie characters that are all talking over each other but in a good way at this point i figured out why i prefer under the whispering door in this book you're seeing a man visit this already established house and yes you are seeing him shed this whole idea of rules and regulations and he's trying to be a more carefree guy but you're also seeing how the kids on the island and how arthur and everybody there how they're trying to accept this new life of incorporating themselves back into the village. So yes, you are following the man, but more importantly, you're following the story of these kids. And the kids already knew each other. They already have a whole history together, so you're just kind of getting a glimpse into it. Whereas with Under the Whispering Door, it's very much the same thing where you are getting this older grumpy man showing up to this pre-established friend group, but the difference is you're following him and his journey. The tea shop doesn't change. They are constantly having people cycle through, and you're just getting to follow one of these people, and you get really connected with his journey and with his development. In this, it's presented like you're focused on him, like you're focused on the main man in this, but really the story is about the kids, which there's nothing wrong with that, but I just preferred how it was done in that one better. I really liked the way that his return to his job was super disconnected. He's just cycling through all of his routines and you're just watching him do step after step. He just has these tasks and he's moving on to the next thing and I think that was represented really well to really show just how boring his life is when he's outside of this place and this is where he really wants to be and this is where the descriptions are so vivid and everything in his life is just so much better. And I think the other reason I couldn't connect to this book as much was because we didn't get enough of their magic. There was like one or two scenes with each of the children where you get to see what they're capable of. You know that Sal can turn into a dog but that only happens twice. I think the most consistent child interaction is just Mr. Bellhop because he's doing that throughout the entire story but for the most part these things that make the characters interesting are just kind of mentioned and then you cling on to that single interaction but when I got to the end I realized I just wish there had been more time to focus on what they're capable of. I just wish we had more time to hang out with them I guess. I love that Linus and Arthur get together at the end. I also love that Zoe the island spirit and Helen the mayor of the village they're all so in love. I thought that was a very cute touch. And then the last thing that I was gonna say is just that this whole book is a giant metaphor for racism right? Like that's kind of what it comes down to. The whole conversation of these people are being treated poorly and because of the way that they're perceived, they're gonna perform worse because people already have expectations about what they are. So they're never able to go anywhere because people aren't going to let them. You keep them segregated from everybody else because they're different than the rest of us. People fear them because they're taught to. See something, say something. It inspires hatred. You think you can control them, you think you can control him, to use him to get what you want, to keep him hidden away with all your other dirty little secrets, but you are wrong. I think the idea is presented in a way that's very easy to consume, while also covering something that's very relevant. I'm gonna assume that's intentional, because it seems painfully obvious, but I think it was done well. It's a cute story about some magical children that just want to have a good time and be kids. It wasn't my most favorite book, but it also wasn't a bad time by any means, so I'm happy I read it. I can definitely understand the hype. And with all that being said, we have reached the end of another video. This video I think is going up on June 3rd, so not too long after recording it. I do still have to record the video that's going up tomorrow, so that's a whole other issue. I just wanted to wrap up this video because it's been going for a little bit now. This timeline is going to be very all over the place. I'm trying to make it very clear when I'm recording versus when I'm posting. I'm trying to state the date and time for every single video so that it makes sense for me and also for you if I'm referencing something that isn't out yet or that I haven't done yet because I'm kind of just bulk recording and then putting out as much as I can whenever I'm able to get to it. But if you like this video and you want to see more of it, you can subscribe to this channel or my main channel, Riverbend, where I post music content or my Instagram, Spotify, TikTok, Goodreads story grab which I will link in the description. If you made it this far thank you so much for watching and I will see you tomorrow with another video. Bye!